والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين اما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته um, this is supposed to be a presentation i have slides but i think it's too troublesome to put down the screen and turn on the projector so i'll just uh, try to use my voice as colorfully as possible so that you don't fall asleep uh, while still take something about the, this history so you know um, when i was in the university of hong kong and sometimes i sit in the prayer room and people would come in and saw me for the first time and they would always ask brother are you from malaysia or indonesia like they don't even give me a chance to be chinese and then i told them that uh, actually i'm 100% made in china and they were very shocked and i'm very shocked by their shock because being made in china is the least shocking thing why would you why would you be shocked if something is made in china right they know there are muslims in china everyone acknowledges the fact that there are Muslims in China but the thing is the Chinese Muslims collectively uh, is, a, is a rather introverted body so we don't connect with the world a lot throughout history and there are many reasons for that there is the you know civilizational trait that we've got the Chinese people are generally quite introverted we don't go out and we don't really communicate that much and there are also other you know political reasons there are historic reasons so generally speaking people don't know a lot about Chinese Muslims people don't hear a lot about chinese muslims sheikh omar suleiman would go on the street and fight for the rights of chinese muslims well i doubt he has ever met any chinese muslim right so our group uh, is quite introverted and uh, in a way a little hidden right behind a veil people don't know much about us uh, that's why I, i feel it's part of my responsibility and it's a true story i was in the united states i was in san francisco and i went into a small masjid to pray asr and the imam is bangladeshi and he saw me and he's like brother where are you from and i said i'm from china and you know his ex facial expression is like he, he has just seen a miracle from allah and it's like brother please sit down let's have a cup of tea uh, we sat down and he said brother you know you have a huge responsibility i said what is that responsibility he said you are from a country with 1.3 billion hard working diligent friendly and nice people good people smart people intelligent people people who have made great contributions to humanity throughout history and most of them the vast majority of them don't even know about the hereafter let alone pursue in the hereafter they don't even know and that's your responsibility and i was putting a cup of tea and i was shaking that's my responsibility so i am a part of you know uh the people who who should take up this responsibility and that's why you know today I, i'm really happy that i have this opportunity to introduce you very briefly about the history of islam in china how islam came to china how the chinese muslims uh you know established their identity as muslims how did they live through this history in a in a very you know unique uh state in a very unique uh civilization because in western civilization religious freedom personal freedom you know was always something central to individual life you know you would you would be taught at a very young age that the whole country should not feel satisfied if one person's right is being violated and that is very different from our civilization as perspective in china we would think that if my sacrifice means that my group this chinese nation would be better off than let me make the sacrifice so it's a different mentality and let's see how uh, you know this history played off <clears throat> so uh, when did islam come to china that's the question brother taha asked uh there are actually more than 10 different opinions on the exact time that islam came to china uh but the majority of historians believes uh that in year 6 uh, 651 we had the first written record of muslims uh, presence in china that's the tang dynasty in china and that at the same time it was the khilafa of the third uh, khalifa uh, uthman ibn affan radiyallahu an so at that time you know after the conqueror uh Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu an the the khilafa the Islamic empire was already very vast geographically it has taken in a large part of the Roman empire it has taken it had taken in a large part of the Persian empire it had taken in you know north africa and even uh, into europe so it was a large khilafa and it just happens that at the same time in china the tang dynasty was a very prosperous uh dynasty this was the second emperor of the tang dynasty uh and it was one of the prime time of chi uh, of chinese economy and uh you know uh prosperity so it was a very uh well off society everyone was happy it was peaceful so naturally you can think that two civilizations both are very strong and both are very prosperous naturally they would have more encounter and more communication with each other so uh, a lot of merchants from uh, central asia and from the middle east started coming to china 
for trade, for business, and according to some records, in this time, 651, that's more than uh, 1,300 years ago, uh, there were already hundreds or thousands of uh, foreign merchants in the capital city of China, Chang'an, at the time, more than day Xi'an, and most of them were Arab and Persian Muslims. <coughs> so obviously, when they came to China, they also brought Islam, wisdom, and they started showing a very unique identity, and the Chinese people called them foreign guests. Okay, foreign guests, they're from a different place, and they are our guests. So at this time, Islam was there, but it was clearly a foreign religion. It was something exotic. It was something that belongs to the big bearded man. It's something that belongs to these traders, these uh, businessmen from far away. It's not something Chinese, right? And the Chinese people have a long cultural heritage of their own. Uh, normally, Chinese people don't tend to take in foreign cultures. We feel happy and content with what we have. So they are just foreign guests. Now, after the Tang Dynasty, there was the Song Dynasty. So during the Song Dynasty, there were two major uh, business roads. One is called the Silk Road, right? That's, that's from the Middle East. Uh, through Central Asia all the way to China, nor northwestern China. And in my hometown, which is in northwestern China, we still have a lot of sites uh, that were used for, you know, as, as uh, uh, the middle stations for this Silk Road. And there was also a sea road uh, from, you know, uh, the south of the Arabic Peninsula all the way to Guangzhou, uh, the city in the southern part of China. And Guangzhou at that time, you can see, was a world business port. Uh, there were many, many foreigners coming to this port, and when they came, they settled down, they need to pray, they build a masjid. So the first masjid that was ever built in China was in Guangzhou. Uh, it is believed it's called Guangtasi, uh, the masjid of the light tower. And if you go to Guangzhou, you can still visit that masjid. It's very beautiful. Um, so so at the Song, uh, in the Song Dynasty, when this foreign guests, what was once considered foreign, they started settling down. They're like, you know, life is pretty good here. Life is peaceful here. And Chinese women are also beautiful. Let's convert them to Islam and let's marry them. Why not? So it happened uh, for another half a century or one century. So they started coming into uh, China and they be started becoming more indigenous. They started becoming people of this land. Um, so you can say that in the Song Dynasty, the Islam, Islam is already starting to become uh, something that is Chinese, that is accepted by Chinese. In 2000, uh, sorry, 1206, uh, year 1206, Genghis Khan united Mongolia and then went on to Russia, what we know as Russia now, and all the way to uh, Central Asia and even, even Middle East. So he conquered a vast land, right, a huge kingdom, and uh, many of the conquered land belonged to Muslims before. Uh, in year two, uh, 1258, remember this year, for the world would never be the same after this year. Well, the word would never be the same after any year. But, but this year was particularly special because uh, the Abbasid Khilafah was destroyed by Genghis Khan. Uh, the, the, at then, it was the center of knowledge and studies. Baghdad was totally sacked, totally destroyed. Uh, libraries were burned down. Uh, people were killed. Um, and then even, eventually, even the whole of China in 1276 was conquered by Genghis Khan and the Mongols as well. And it's the new uh, dynasty, the Yuan dynasty. So remember, before the Yuan dynasty, uh, the Muslims were considered more or less, you know, marginalized. They are outsiders. They are, you know, uh, on the free for area of China. But during the Yuan dynasty, first of all, the ruling, uh, the ruling race is not Han Chinese anymore. The ruling race is Mongols. And when they came into China and they started this government, obviously they, uh, they had to you know, maintain, their, maintain their rule. So they took a lot of Muslims from Central Asia and Arab world to China to establish you know, industry and uh, uh, economy and all kinds of things. So many Muslims started coming in, uh, artists, uh, partisans, and scholars. Uh, and once they came, they started having more com communication with the Chinese people. Um, and they actually raised their social status a lot. So at this time, there were already, uh, in, in the Yuan Dynasty, and the Yuan Dynasty only lasted for about maybe 200 years, slightly more than 200 years, uh, but there were at, uh, in total 22 you know, provincial level governors that were Muslims. And obviously when you have leaders, when you have people in the government that are representing Muslims, then the, the status of Islam raised a lot in, Islam, uh, in China and became an official language, a recognized, uh, sorry, an official religion, a recognized religion. Uh, and even, subhanAllah, this is, you wouldn't believe this, in the Yuan Dynasty, there was one governmental department called the Department of Qadi, Hadith, Department of Qadi, and Qadi is an Arabic word for judge. Okay, Qadi is somebody who would rule and give uh, a legal decision based on Sharia. 
So we had a department called the Department of Qadi because the government basically said, okay, you Muslims, you deal with your issues with your law. You don't have to conform to our law. You use your own sharia to, de to decide uh, what is best for you. So that was the freedom, you can say, and the tolerance uh, during the Yuan Dynasty. So there was a Chinese saying which says that Yuan Shi Hui Hui Bian Tian Xia. So during Yuan Dynasty, Muslims are all over the world. Although the Chinese people thought China was world. So actually, Chinese people, uh, Muslims were all over China. But we have this saying that Muslims were all over the world during the Yuan Dynasty. And when it came to Ming Dynasty, we're getting close to modern time. During the Ming Dynasty, the situation changed dramatically because it's a regime, again, established by Han Chinese, the majority of uh, uh, indigenous local Chinese people. And this, uh, this, this dynasty, the emperors were not tolerant of foreign ideas and philosophies as those of Yuan Dynasty. So they started restricting uh, other you know, ideas. They started, uh, how to say, defending uh, more, more of the local religions and mo uh, local thoughts, uh, and others are considered unorthodox. So Confucianism, Taoism, these local thoughts are being put to a superior position, and Islam and even Christianity started coming in as well, are considered unorthodox and unwelcome and restrained. Uh, there was a crisis for, for knowledge because people started losing contact with their religious identity. They started being assimilated into the Han culture or the local Chinese culture. So one of the, uh, Dr. Ma Jianming, who stu studied, uh, did his PhD in uh, International Islamic University of Malaysia, he said something quite interesting. He said, if Yuan Dynasty was the time that Muslims assimilated Mongols, a lot of Mongol soldiers, when they conquered Muslims, they converted to Islam because they saw the sobr. They saw the faith in these people, and they saw the discipline of these people. They saw the kind of mercy and kindness that these people who lost in battle, but they still had this courage, they still had these qualities. Many Mongol soldiers uh, converted to Islam and became Muslims. So Yuan Dynasty was the time that Muslims assimilated Mongols, but Ming Dynasty was the time when the Han, the local Chinese people, assimilated Muslims. And this was the time when, when Chinese Muslims would become more and more Chinese. You know, this is something really special about Chinese Muslims. Uh, nowadays in European countries, uh, in North America, in Western countries basically, you know, the, the haters uh, or the, what, what, what do we call them, the xenophobics, they would al always say to Muslims, go back to your country, right? They, they immediately make this mental uh, relation between Muslim and immigrant. So if you're Muslim, you're not from us. You're not from this place originally. Go back to your country. But in China, it's very different. Nobody has ever said to me, go back to your country, because that is my country. Everyone knows that I am from China. My ancestors are from China. I've, my family has been there probably for over a thousand years. Nobody can say to me, go back to your country. This is my country. This is something special about uh, the Chinese Muslims. And this happened during the Ming Dynasty. They, they assimilated into the culture and became more and more Chinese. There's nothing really uniquely, distinctly special about being a Muslim. You wouldn't even know, right, and, until a person gets to 50 years old. You don't even see my beard now, although I'm trying really hard. But when I get to 50 years old, you all, that, that's when you see maybe he's a Muslim. But now he's just a Chinese. If I don't tell you, you wouldn't know, right? Now that's why when I was traveling around the world, going to different places, I was stopped a lot at masjid. I would go there and people were like, hey, hey, hey hold on, brother. What are you doing here? What do you want to do? Ashhadu la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad rasul. Happened a lot, a lot of times. And then, during the Ming Dynasty, the Chinese Muslims started developing several systems to maintain their identity, to maintain the knowledge. And there was the mosque education system, similar to madrasa system in, in South Asia. So in this masajid in China, they would teach Islam using uh, Arabic and Persian languages. They would use very little uh, Chinese, actually, and they would teach tafsir, they would teach ahadith in Arabic and Persian. And that's why even nowadays, you go to northwest China, there are a lot of uh, Muslim people who are, you know, relatively less educated. They don't even speak Chinese very well. They don't even speak Mandarin perfectly. But if you go there and you tell them that, uh, or wudu, and th these words they know, they know these words, because Islam has been transmitted in a way that is mixed with Arabic and Persian and other languages. It's not purely Chinese. And we have a lot of Persian words in our daily use, usage. We don't call Fajr, Fajr, we call it Bamda. It's Persian. Uh, we don't call Salah, Salah, we call it Namaz. Similar to South Asia, we use Persian words. Anyway, another way of uh, maintaining knowledge and defending this identity is called Han Kitab. Kitab is Arabic word for book, and Han is actually the uh, ethnicity of the Chinese people. What is meant by Han Kitab? So before the Ming Dynasty, uh, 
Islam is something that we only teach to Muslims. So Muslim parents teach Muslim children. That's it. We never tried to tell people about Islam. We never tried to t tell people what is this religion. But during the Han Kitab movement, this is a movement, many very learned scholars uh, started composing books in Chinese with reference to Chinese uh, ideas and Chinese conceptions uh, to, to introduce Islam to them. For example, I read this amazing book, and subhanAllah, you know a lot of times when people think of Chinese Muslims, they think of, oh, these poor people, they're being oppressed, they're being sent to concentration camps, they don't even know their religion, they're poorly educated. They're... But actually, we had great scholars in the past. Okay? I've read many books in English, in Arabic, in, in, in Chinese, and I've, you know, some of those Chinese books are just amazing. In this one book, the author, he started, and, and his format is very interesting. He wrote a book, it's basically like a Q&A. So he said, my guest asked me, why don't you eat pork? And he starts answering, right? And in his answer, he didn't answer from an Islamic perspective first. He started quoting the ancient Chinese literature, you know, from like 200 BC, the rules and regulations of the Chinese emperor at the time to the Chinese people. And he said, well, actually, you have more uh, regulations pertaining to food than us. Right? It was written in ch ancient Chinese literature that if a meat is not cut uh, properly, we will not eat it. So he said, you have more haram stuff than me. Why are you accusing me of being you know, restrictive and things like that? He started giving ideas about, uh, he started introducing Allah uh, with reference to the Chinese concept of sky, tian. It's, it's actually similar to our, because tian in Chinese, subhanAllah, it's one and it's yi and da, one and bi. The two names of Allah composed the Chinese character Tian, sky, and it's always been considered the highest supreme being who is in control and the creator of everything, similar to our concept, our monotheist re uh, religion. So he started using all of these concepts to, to introduce Islam, and so during this time, Islam really gained a momentum. More and more people got to know Islam. Uh, and after the Ming Dynasty, there was the Qin Dynasty, another hard, harsh time for Muslims. So throughout this history, you can see there are good times, there are bad times, it's sometimes it's uh, freer to practice, sometimes it's more uh, harder. And that's why, you know, sometimes uh, when Chinese Muslims complain about our current situation, oh, it's so hard, I envy you, brother, you're in Hong Kong, you can have at the peak conference, we can't even talk in our own room. You know, we are free to talk in our own room. What if there's a red dot appeared on my head and, and I'll be gone just for talking about Islam. Uh, but the, the thing is, uh, a brother re reminded me that uh, if you look at Chinese history, we've had worse times. We've had much worse times. And, Muslim, and those dynasties are gone. The Tang dynasty is no more. The Song dynasty is no more. The Qin dynasty is no more. But Islam is still in China. Muslims are still there. Right? Islam never dies. These dynasties will go away. These politicians will go away. But Islam is always there. This is inna dina indallahi islam Very quickly, I want to recap. But we are coming to the modern age. After the Qin dynasty, there was the Republic of China, which is different from the People's Republic of China, 1911. And during this time, it was relatively free. We started uh, you know, composing many books. Professor Muhammad Majian, the one who translated the Quran into Chinese, was born in this uh, period as well. He studied in, studied in Al-Azhar. He was a, rec a recognized scholar not only by Chinese Muslims, but actually by Muslims all around the world, uh, especially in Egypt as well. He translated the Quran, and then PRC was founded in uh, 1949, um, and uh, we continued to try our best uh, with whatever we, we are able to maintain our identity. And I, I can guarantee you, I personally guarantee you, uh, when I go back to my hometown, uh, every Ramadan I try to go back to my hometown for a few days at least, and Yes, the Muslims there may not know a lot about Islam. They may not have, have, have as much knowledge about uh, fiqh or, you know, sharia. But Fajr prayer, any masjid. In, in my hometown, Lanzhou, there are more than 30 masajid. You go to any masjid, even a smaller one in an alley, for Fajr prayer, at least 100 people. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he distributes uh, his blessings and mercy to different nations in different ways. Some nations have more knowledge. Some nations have more uh, IT skills for da'wah. And some nations just have more persistence with their basics. And this is something that I think the Chinese people are uh, special for. These, they stick to their basics, and they're nice people. So I want to change this perception that, oh, the Chinese Muslims are just poor, oppressed, you know, uh, poor people. No, we have had scholars. We have had shining stars. We have made great contributions to Islam. The earliest Hajj from China to Mecca was before year 1000. 
in the 10th century, in the 9th century, they were already going for Hajj. After, they, they had to travel for three months or six months, half a year, but they were already doing that. So let's change that perception. I encourage you, you're at the gate of China. I encourage all of you, when you have an opportunity, go to China, go visit the first masjid in Guangzhou, go see the Chinese Muslims, talk to them, uh, look at uh, what they're doing, and you will feel the power of Islam, really. When you go to China, you see Chinese Muslims, you will not feel sad for Islam, you will feel proud of Islam. Uh, and this is, you know, my, my message to you. Uh, and uh, if you have more questions about Chinese Muslims or the history of Islam in China, you want to see some pictures, feel free to come to me, and I'd be more than happy to share with you. Jazakum Allahu khayran. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barik ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.